230 leaner. Damn. How'd you feel with that weight? Um, I felt, I felt great. Yeah, I felt really good. Um, I think the, the biggest difference between bodybuilding and like now is just like, I was just like more dialed in, gotcha. you know, I don't, I don't have the, I don't have the same time investment into, you know, that was like a very specific thing yeah. for like a short period of time. You How know? long did you prep? It, it wasn't very long. I only, I only prepped for like nine weeks. Wow. Did you know you were going to do it or nine weeks out you said, I might do a bodybuilding contest? No, I, I, what happened is I had, um, <laughs> I had Hani Rambad on the show okay. and he's like, you're in pretty good shape. He's like, yeah, I think you owe it to your fans. You need to do a bodybuilding show. And I just said, I, I'm like, I don't know anything about bodybuilding, you know? So then he, he was like, well, I, I got you covered. You know, I'll coach you. I was like, shit, if you're going to coach me, then, awesome. you know, it, it, it would, uh, it, it was challenging. Um, but like, I wasn't coming from like so far, you know what I mean? It wasn't like, I already lost a bunch of weight from powerlifting. You yeah. know, I was already retired. So it wasn't that hard of a transition. Did you notice? Cause I was, I was 282 at one point in my own journey. Yeah. And did you notice, cause I went 282 all the way down to 170. So I fought at Walter. The size of this kid. <laughs> What's up, Kenny? Kenny? Kenny, this is Mike. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Right on, brother. Um, Why? <laughs> no, Jesus. <laughs> Rock. You were 280? 282, yep, right. <laughs> and I had to look back, I'm like, Jesus. Then went all the way down to 170. And now I'm like, you know, 204, 206, kind of bouncing that area. Were you that big when you were fighting? No, when I was fighting, I was like, I was walking around at like 215, 212, 218. Let's, let's walk, so we're moving. Walking around at like 215, 218, two, you know, 212, 218. And then my first fight was 205 and then 185. And then I could cut weight. So I was like, let me just go down to 170, right? So I was cutting like 40 pounds. And that's how I wrote three weeks to shredded. Because I, I was fighting and I was teaching this women's fit class at Team Quest. And over six weeks, I'd lose 40 pounds. And the ladies were like... What like, are you, what's the, happening? How the hell did you do that? And they would, they wouldn't let me leave class. So like class would be over at like eight o'clock at night. Right. And they'd all want to ask me a question and it was all diet related. Mm. So I'd spend like an hour answering these questions. And that's where I was like, I got to write something. And it became like a free giveaway that you can just give the people. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of how that started. Um, so like, yeah, 282 down to 170. And then like now in the low twos is my normal love this weight this yeah. life right but did you have any skin issues that was like my, my question it's like you know as big as you were over three they yeah. coming all the way down how did you deal with that because you, you look great your photos were awesome yeah, thank you. but do you still notice like your skin is a little extra yeah yeah i mean there's some small i mean i can't complain you know what i mean like i've seen some people have some really hard struggles with it you know um i have stuff that probably just i notice you know, other people wouldn't really notice, but I noticed like, for example, like it's really weird, but like if I'm in like a push up position, my skin will sag a little bit right here. Me too. 100%. You know? yeah. and, but it's like not normally saggy. Um, if I flex real hard and move certain ways, yeah. kind of see a little bit, but I'm, um, I'm happy with it. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of my body. I feel really good about it. I feel good about the decisions I make with my nutrition. Um, I like what you said on our podcast just now about you're either making like one step towards being healthier or one step towards declining, you know, or going backwards. And I think, you know, not, not everything has to be so cut and dry that way, but that is a nice way of looking at it. Hey, I'm going to eat this cheesecake and I'm in recognition of this might be a regression. This might be a step backwards. And instead of that, instead of me having that, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take some blueberries and some strawberries and throw them in a bowl and have that with some Greek yogurt instead. Like you're moving towards progression or you're moving backwards. It makes it a lot easier for the average person. They get caught up in that decision making matrix yep. and there's so much information out there. So if you just make it simple, is it good or it's bad? Like a lot of times people will argue the gray area and that leaves up leaves too much room for capitulation and cultural bias and you know emotional you know eating you know emotional the emotional impact 
So then if it's just, if it's black or white, is it good or it's bad? That's no, bad, no, don't do it. You know, and, and I think the, a key factor too is to evolve and, and don't, there's no, re, there's no real great reason to, you know, have this like hill to die on mentality. Yeah. I think it's good, I think you're better off recognizing like I could be wrong and let me just hold the phone on whether I actually know exactly what I'm talking about or not. Yeah. And let me pump the brakes a little bit. And so for myself, you know, being somebody that loves, and I still enjoy like low carb lifestyle, low carb dieting. Um, however, I don't eat a bunch of crappy fake food, you know, like uh, sometimes you see people eating like keto bombs and these different things. I don't eat a lot of that stuff. If I do have some of that stuff, it makes represents a very, very small percentage of my diet. Yeah. And I'm in recognition that it's process. You know, I'm, I'm aware that it's uh, not the best for me. And then also when I was doing the keto diet for so long, even though I wouldn't gain weight or I was able to lose weight or whatever it might be, I was consuming tremendous amounts of fat. And at some point, uh, again, like we could sit here and argue about it. You can try to figure out is saturated fat and so on. But why, for me, why be so stubborn with it when you could be making a health choice that's detrimental? Yeah. It's not that much harder to cut out some of the fat. Yeah, I don't agreed. need 300 grams of fat a day. So like, why not work your way towards 150 or 200 or just something more reasonable, you know, more reasonable number. So that's the stuff I've been working on over the last couple of years. And it's, it's been really helpful and I've landed on similar thing to what you're landing on and you're going to hear more and more people talking about eating whole foods and just doing your best to get rid of the highly processed crap that so much of us are, were falsely led to believe uh, may have been like not a horrible idea because of its nutritional or its uh, statistical macronutrient value you know yeah I, in the podcast, I had mentioned, you know, Mark Sisson, you know, I blame Mark, you know, yeah, jokingly, yeah. because his mention of that low carb eating and, and metabolic flexibility, you know, he was onto something there, but that created the whole keto movement. And back in, that was like, I think 2017, yeah. 16 or 17. And at that period of time, I had put out a video and it broke down the, what I called the, the fed dietary phases and it was every 18 to 18 to 36 months a new version of a diet program comes out historically and it usually is the offspring of the one previous and i had said listen it went from zone to paleo to keto carnivore yeah. fasting it got more and more and more exclusionary. Right. And I said, and then it will go full circle where people will start to realize, well, shoot, that didn't work, let me tweak it. That didn't work, let me tweak it. That didn't work, let me tweak it. And then it'll get down into where they start putting carbohydrates back in. And it becomes more of this type of meal plan. But then the marketers will need something else to sell. So then that's where the macro programs will come back in. Well, if you're gonna be eating whole foods, you got to do the macros like this because I have to sell you something. They have to sell you something. There needs a new point of differentiation. Right. And this is the way the cycles go because, I mean, Zone is basically a macro program. Oh, how much money did, did keto and um, in addition to keto, um, uh, the, the gluten-free movement, you know? Yeah. It's like there's so many uh, inventions and creations and getting that gluten-free stamp of approval. And I think people again they misinterpret that and they think that means it's a healthy food yeah and that it's a safe food but yeah. windex is gluten-free <laughs> right 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 no and it, it's that now it's like you have to have that on your packaging you know it's gluten-free right. it's keto fat friendly it's gliophosphate free it's like man how many things right must be on packaging now just to make sure you're ticking one of the boxes for the consumer i i really again i think some of the stuff you're talking about in the podcast and even just in your visit here at super training and stuff, it really resonates with me a lot. I I've never been a huge fan of counting calories. 
although I don't necessarily want to discourage people from doing stuff if it's working well for them or if they're making progress. But if you choose the quality of the food that you're eating, what's the sense in tracking it really? Like, what are we tracking? If you had some healthy meat, some, he some vegetables, some fruits, you had a bunch of stuff that comes from the earth that was, I would say, if I step up on the oh yeah, cl c clearly here uh, for us, you know, um, to eat. Yep. That, it's like, well, what are you, what are you tracking? Why are you tracking broccoli and chicken and rice? You are hitting it on the head. Where when we're eating single ingredient whole foods, and I say that intentionally because people need to understand that whole foods is not going to whole foods and buying a <laughs> box of sugar pops, right. organic sugar pops, right? Right. A single ingredient whole foods. Once you're eating that and you are aware of how your body's responding to it, you don't have to weigh it. You don't have to measure it. Like now, maybe guys like us or, and, and see them where we're at this higher level and we're like, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm trying to put a pound, like I'm trying to put a pound of muscle tissue on this year. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, at 47 years yeah. old, that's a lot, man. Right, I've been right. doing this my whole 40 years almost, right? <laughs> right? If I add one more muscle, pound of muscle, that's a lot. So I really have to turn every lever I can. So that's where I might need to, you know, protein leverage a little bit make sure I'm really focused on what my intake is and I'm getting six meals instead of five meals. And I, you, you gotta go down deep. That's the only time, it's like that, that acute performance phase where less than 10% of the population will ever need to do that. And then again, is only 10% of the time. Right. Most of it, I don't have to worry about that. I never worry about that stuff most of the time, but like right now I'm gonna get a little granular. So like, why is there, to your point, there there's this focus on counting calories and counting macros where they're focused on the wrong thing where it should be on the quality of food and that's what i think a lot of the fitness industry is lacking is that type of messaging and i think when you go into the kind of general pop i think the general population unfortunately has lost their sensitivity and they lost their um their understanding of how palatable and how good whole foods are. Yeah. Yeah. They taste amazing. Yeah. You know, I don't think that sometimes I think there's a lot of people that probably haven't tried to eat uh, a piece of steak or a piece of fish. It's not like, you know, doused in tons of salt or sauces. I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, salt and pepper and spices. I think they're all fair game. Agreed. Go for it. But you should learn the taste and the texture of some of these foods it's it's a good practice to work on and i have been saying this for years i think a lot of people have what i call gas station taste buds okay okay you know because they're so <laughs> used to eating these convenient foods that they're desensitized yeah um you can go to the you know nicest restaurant in the world with the best steak ever and if somebody if if uh they also cooked up French fries with a bunch of cheese on it and a bunch of amazing sauce and everything. If you were to eat that before you had this steak that was cooked by the greatest chef in the world and the greatest cut of meat anyone's ever seen, you'll barely be able to taste that meat. Yeah. And so we've been desensitized. We, our, our tongue no longer uh, works the way it needs to, to to identify how flavorful whole foods actually really are. And then even combining them a little bit, you got a plate of chicken, you have some beans, you have some rice. I mean, now you're having a, a goddamn party. That's it. Back when the industrial revolution, right? And, and people are migrating from farms to cities, food preservation was challenging. So the, the sauces, the, the ketchups and the steak sauces, those were made out of necessity to hide the rancid flavor of the meat. They were not made to enhance the current flavor of steak. Right. It was because the meat was going bad and it tasted like it. Mm -hmm. So there needed to be that sauce to hide the flavor. So if you ever go to your point, a high quality restaurant, have you asked for steak sauce? They'd be like, we don't have that. Oh here. yeah. How yeah, dare yeah. you like insult us, insult the chef. I'm going to put ketchup on my steak. Exactly. Right. <laughs> 
But the average person is so normalized that it's like they can't eat steak or a burger without it. And they don't know what it is, what it tastes like, where I freaking love the flavor of real food. It's been so long since I've added the, the slop, let's say, to my meals. I don't want it. And like, if I do, if I go to a restaurant, I'm like, oh, I can taste this is there's an oil on this why is there oil on my steak like what are they fucking Yo, doing yeah yeah it's yeah it's infuriating right and what's interesting is go out to a a, a steakhouse let's say you, you spend 40 80 bucks on a piece of meat the next morning you're in the toilet like what the hell just oh, happened yeah, yeah. right so it's like you can very clearly see that they've they've doctored the meat and that's at a nice steakhouse right yeah. And like, you know, get a baked potato, you know, whatever kind of veggie. So it's, it's the meat itself. It, so it becomes a challenge. You know, that's, that's a real challenge. That's a bigger challenge, I think, in, in my world as, you know, maybe atypical. How many, how many people have you worked with over the years? Do you have a, do you have um, a count? I do. Do you have some sort of rough number? I do about a thousand consultations a year. Wow. So I do about four a day, four 30 minute consults, five <laughs> days a week, right? Yeah. And that's for years and years. I've worked with over 200 individual UFC athletes. And that's multiple times each, right? I've worked with every major sports organization, athletes from, you know, New York Yankees and um, Manchester United. So I've worked with some of like those type of high level people. And it's hard to say like the, the personal impact, but it's, yeah. It's thousands to tens of thousands without really measuring anymore. Right. And what I love about that, Mark, is I have, like, I'm a people person. Like, I love to talk to people yeah. and, like, have these deep conversations. And, like, with Andrew, it's I like, I think man. that's what separates you out from a lot of other coaches is that there's a lot of great coaches out there, a lot of people doing a lot of great things. But so often you just see it online. Yeah. They're mainly only doing it online. I really value, I personally value the coach that is not just an online coach, that's also an in-person coach. And I know you've had, you've actually physically coached and physically went and coached a lot of these athletes yeah. face to face. And there's a, it's just a different ball game yeah. than just, uh, you know, text and just uh, email and stuff like that. So back when I was working with all the UFC fighters, I would like, if you're going to work together, I need to come out and I need to spend a day or two with you. Right. I need to sit in yeah, your what's kitchen your table, life like? meet your family. I need to drive to the gym with you. I need to see what you see, know what you know. I need to experience your life in order for me to really do my job that you deserve it. Like I, I need to sleep in your guest room. I need to hear the hum of your house. Like I want to, I want to look at your kitchen. I want to see your cabinets. I want to see, you know, what are you cooking with? Like that way I can so much better help, right. And coach, right. So I can as close as I can be there. And then I would come out and be a part of that. And a lot of it was at, at financial loss because that's a lot of time. Yeah. It's like time invasive and, you Very know, much so, yeah. some of the athletes, they have a little bit of extra money, they're making decent money, but an athlete who makes a hundred grand a year, a year, hundred grand a fight. If I'm getting 5%, that's five grand right. for an eight week training camp. <laughs> right. And I'm on the road and I got a team, right? There's overhead. Like, so it's like, I'm looking at minimum wage <laughs> right. for a lot of these athletes, right? During that period of time. But that wasn't the point of it. It was like, I'm on the journey. I committed to the job. We got to keep you safe and healthy, make weight, win the title, boom, move on and kind of do the thing. But it's, it's that in-person coaching. I love that. Yeah. I was like, man, I, I can't get away from that. Uh, give me some of the rundown on the Dolce diet. So we are a longevity based company that focuses on the, the short and immediate term results, you know, that, that suit your goals. No matter what we do, it's all going to be longevity based. We're never going to make that type of trade off. But you want to, you got an MMA fight coming up. You want to run a marathon. You just, just get a, a nasty gram from your cardiologist. That's the, the short term goal. We take a longevity based scientific approach to that. We focus on whole foods, real food. That is the primary go to. We definitely want to leverage blood work and medical assistance we want to work with a medical team we want all your doctors on board we liaise very well with your team whoever you work with we love that the more data the better the more research the better but we want to avoid the need for doctors we don't want the doctors to be a part of it but not to meddle yeah. 
Like, I don't, like Doc, if we do our job correctly, we don't need you, yeah. but we want you here, review the work, let us know what's going on. So the, the Dolce diet, it really, it, it's because of alliteration. It just sounds cool, yep. right? And it works, but we say it's, it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle. So yeah, there's nutrition and that matters, but it's more than that. It's, well, what time did you go to bed? Like, how are you handling your finances? What type of stress are you dealing with in your life? Right? Like, there's a much bigger picture to this than just chicken and rice. Like, why aren't you eating the chicken and the rice like you're supposed to? Well, because there's so many other things. So we, we really try and like, one-on-one, -on -one, we really get down deep into people's lives. Like, when you, you start working with us, your relationship should, relationship should get better, your net worth should go up, like your abs should start popping out, your energy should go through the roof. It's like, that's, that's the goal for us. So it's more of a lifestyle-based approach, but we use you know physical augmentation as kind of the sizzle that that sells the steak. You said something on a podcast that I thought was amazing. You said um, people will often celebrate with self-harm. Can you elaborate on that a bit? We're taught very young when we do something good, we should poison ourselves. We typically with processed sugar. And then we look around at the adults and they're poisoning themselves with alcohol and drugs. You think about most holidays, most birthdays, most family parties, most major events, they're all celebrated with synthetic toxic chemicals that do harm, right? right? Why is that? It's typically because that's what we've been taught through the generation before us. And me as a father, I think a, a young father, my you know, kids are still single digits. I was very aware of that and working with so many people who suffer from a lineage of bad decisions and health issues. You know, your granddad had a heart attack and died, your dad had a heart attack and died, and you have advanced cardiovascular disease on your way to having a heart attack and dying. Like, oh, yeah. hey, dummy, like you gotta break the cycle here and now you're passing it down to your kids because you're eating a bucket of fried chicken every Tuesday night, mm. right? And, and drinking soda and whatnot. So the whole concept of you know, people, they celebrate these major milestones by poisoning themselves. It's a cultural affect that people will aggressively defend, right? So like, I'll, I'll put, hey man, like my kids Easter baskets, they don't have any candy in it. It's all like stuffed animals and toys and really cool stuff. And people are like, oh, you know, your kids are gonna grow up and like they're gonna, like people say nasty stuff. They're gonna hate you. It's like wishing my kids harm yeah. because I choose not to harm my kids today. It's like we're teaching them something different. So we don't celebrate like that. I, I don't drink alcohol, I don't do drugs. Like, you know, not that I, I, you know, never smoked weed or drank a beer. Like, yeah, once upon a time, but it doesn't do anything for me. Like, I don't enjoy that. My kids would never see that. So it's like, we don't normalize that in front of them and giving them the ability to see how life can be when it's lived optimally. I mean, and that's something I never had, and most of us never had that. And I think the world is at a point now where we need more of that than what's currently happening, which is this cultural decay. Like people, it's like they're in a rush to burn the whole world down and their own lives with it. And it, it's, it's baffling. And, and most people, it's like they fight for that. They, they don't want, to hear anything other than, you know what, Thursday night, you should start drinking and pretty much don't stop until you have to go to work on Monday morning, right? That's what most people pretty much partake in, you know, girls night on Thursday night and anytime my buddies. I think people get, I think they get offended um, because you're, you're kind of, you're challenging. And I think that's what happens with nutrition too. Nutrition is like, I'm challenging and questioning your lifestyle yep. choices. And that's where sometimes people get upset but if we're just being honest, and I'll, I'll just speak for myself on this one, like, I still, I still do self-harm. You know, I still, you know, I'll, I'll uh, I don't know, I eat good for 10, 15 days in a row or something like that. And here and there, I'll, I'll have, you know, something that's like off plan. Now, I'm way better at that than I used to be because it used to be like a party and I would go crazy with it. Yeah. But I started recognizing some of the things that you're talking about and, and truthfully, and people will be offended and upset by this if 
if you're emotionally eating and or drinking, the day felt long, the day felt stressful, this and that, it's because you can't handle currently what you're going through. And, and this, uh, that's not meant to hurt anybody. It's meant to have you think about your lifestyle a little bit more and your life in general. Like, why are you always behind? Yeah. Are there things that you can do better? Has life given you the shorter straw? Like, sometimes that does happen. Yeah. There's shitty things that happen, all of us. But how can you start to work your way out of that? How do you get yourself ahead? How do you, uh, how are you no longer late with your rent and, and so on? You know, these are things you got to start to, to think about, but you're like thinking, well, maybe I'm eating this way because my relationship with my girlfriend sucks and maybe this other relationship is weird and I don't always show up to work on time. And you're just like, you're, I mean, your stress levels are through the roof. And really, in my opinion, a lot of stress should actually be more of an input that the body registers as being positive. Like we're doing a little stressor right now, a little bit of exercise or a stressor of like lifting weights. In general, the largest percentage of those stressors that come from those things, they should be pretty positive with the exception of you get after it a little bit, you know, a little bit too much here and there, right? That's kind of the way I, I look at it. And so if you're, if you're reaching for a Ben and Jerry's, if you're reaching for those chips, there's probably something that happened somewhere along the week that may have overstressed you and led you down that path. Yeah. If people need an escape through drugs, alcohol, sugar, porn, they need an escape from their life. And how common is, common is it for the person to be like, oh, you know, I need to unwind at the end of the day with a couple cocktails. Right. Well, how bad is your life that you need to poison yourself to cope with what happened during your day. And to your point, what can we do to fix your day? Car. Oh, we're good. Good. <laughs> the guy was going pretty fast. I know. What, what can we do to fix your day that you don't feel the compulsion to poison yourself and to blunt the memory through, you know, drugs and alcohol? And that's where most people are. And it's, it's sad to see. So you're very self-aware and you're doing the work and you're making these changes and these sweeping changes in your life. And you continue to push that and evolve. So a year from now, you'll be farther onto your journey. And like the changes you've made from a year ago to now are notable and transformative. And then a year from now, they'll be even more so. And that never stops. So it feels good. good. It feels, it feels really, really good, good yeah. yeah. It's like it's progress. Feels it feels liberating. liberating. It, feels it feels more liberating, liberating, than, eating liberating than, than eating junk, junk food. Yes. So, so it's, Which it's probably sound sounds weird, weird to people. It's, it's easier to say no to the junk food than it is to eat it when you look at it like that. It's harder to poison yourself because you understand what the downstream effect will be and you accept that, right? Where the average person is like, oh my God, what a shitty day. I'm just going to eat myself horribly. So then I feel disgusting inside. And then the self-loathing and the guilt kicks in. And I wake up tomorrow and I'm just uh, groggy and I'm not happy with myself. My clothes don't fit anymore and I have low energy and I can't really think. it. I hate my job and I'm late for work. Like that cycle keeps multiplying and it compounds over time. And if the average person would just understand in this very moment, they have the decision to change that with the thought of, I will change that. Mm -hmm. And from that point forward, they don't do that anymore. Their life immediately gets better. Like what you said, it feels amazing. Immediately, yeah, right. you get better. Everything feels better. It's fuck, man. It's so hard to communicate that because most people don't believe it. They're like, oh, you're a fucking weirdo. Yeah, that's true. Your kids are going to be fucked up when they grow up because you don't, <laughs> you don't feed them sugar on Halloween. It's like, no, that's not the way it works. Yeah, I've talked to my kids about nutrition from the time they were real little. And uh, I'm really fortunate that, you know, they, they both have been receptive to it all. How old are they? Uh, my son is 20 and my daughter is 16. And neither one of them is addicted to food. And I'm so proud of that. Like, I'm, I really feel great about that. And we, we've talked to them and we, we have examples. You know, my mother uh, died a few years ago and 
kind of used her as an example, you know, like Grandma Rosie, Rosie uh, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't really uh, eat properly. She doesn't take care of herself. So she's sick. She's not doing well. Yeah. And she'll probably die early. And that's exactly. I don't think that's a negative thing to do, to utilize people that are in close proximity. Most people have an uncle or a brother or somebody in the family that drinks too much or does drugs or uh, is obese. And I think you can point to point to those people with your children and say, hey, they're kind of in this compromised position because of this. And they're not going to be able to enjoy life the same way as some of the stuff that we do. And I don't know, maybe other people think that's too judgy or whatever, but that's that's kind of that's the way I raised my kids. And I also taught my kids from the time they were really little about nutrition. I talked to them about it so plainly. You know, if you eat those things, it's really hard to stop. They're these hyper palatable foods. They taste really yummy. They taste really good. I dumb it down or say it in like more kid terms sure. and say uh, it's hard to control yourself on how much of those you eat. And then, you know, throughout the day, they would ask, hey, could I have this? Could I have that? Because we weren't super, we weren't super tight and super strict with it until it was like a progression over a few years that I was tightening up my own diet. And so they were kind of going along uh, for the ride. But my kids would ask questions and they would say, hey, can I have this? And I'd say, well, you know, you had a, a soda earlier in the day. And they would go, oh, okay, <laughs> you know. And so it was just it was like a little give and take in there over time. But, uh, but I'm again, I'm really grateful that neither one of them uh, developed an issue where they tend to want to overeat or eat a bunch of junk. Neither one of them eat a bunch of junk, shitty food. Yeah, and that's good parenting because they you model the behavior, right? They, they watch you, they watch your wife, they watch the way you, you interact inside the household. They hear your conversations, they take your lessons, you know, sharing the, the story of your mom for them to see in real time, that is loving to them because it's true. We have to be true, we have to be honest with our kids. That's real. Yeah. It's real and it's someone that they know and love and they clearly see what the cause and effect of that is. And your mom definitely would not want them to go down that same road, Absolutely. right? So it, it's honoring her through her example I, I appreciate that, man. Good for you guys. Yeah, I think, you know, um, one of the things I try to share and try to do as well is try, I try to share with people what are some good options? You know, like we're talking about these uh, really tasty foods, hyper palatable foods. And I know for you and I know for myself, we both love, you know, meat. We love chicken. We love steak. We love fish and so on. List goes on and on. We like all the whole foods and stuff, but what are some whole foods type things that you do that are, um, I guess, a little bit like a treat for yourself or a snack for yourself? You mentioned you have cookies with you. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, can you explain a little bit of that kind of stuff to people so that they know that you're not, you know, not just so strict on just these whole foods. Every once in a while, you might mix some ingredients together to make something more palatable. We've always been able to reverse engineer culturally significant recipes. So we've worked with a rather eclectic glip or group of clients, right? From all around the world, which is really cool. So part of me visiting them and going to their houses, well, I would see the way they eat. I would ask like, hey, when you were a little boy, what did your mom make for you when you were sick? What did your grandma make when you go to her house? What was like the big family meal? And I was like, all right, let me figure out how to reverse engineer that so we have a healthy version of that type of food we can serve up to them. So like in our house, man, we have like, we do taco night, you know, we have, you know, pastas and, and, you know, we'll do meatloaf, but it's all made with, with just whole single ingredient sources, right? So it's all, it's, we're not using the, the panko. We'll use like oat bran instead of panko breadcrumbs. If we're going to make fried, we call it, you know, thoroughbreded fried chicken after, you know, Jay Haran because um, he loved fried chicken, right? So what we do is we would, you know, thin cut uh, the cutlet, you know, whip the egg, thin cut the cutlet, boom, put it in there. Then we would have the oat bran instead of panko. We'd soak that, you know, in, in the, the oat bran and then we cook it in coconut oil. It's fucking tremendous. It's so delicious. 
but we got our carbohydrates, we got our fats, we got our protein, all in these delicious little cutlets. I mean, it's great to like throw in your bag, take on the go, oh, like when wow. you travel Sounds with good. it. It's so good, right? Yeah. So it's like you're eating fried chicken. Our kids love it. You know, kids who come over who don't eat like this, they love it. Like, you know, our kids' friends, let's say, right. we're eating chicken nuggets. They don't know any better. They're just like, where's fried chicken? Right. Right, right? Right. It's delicious. So something like that, um, we make like an ice cream out of Greek yogurt. We'll do like, uh, you know, a cup or two of, of black cherries frozen with, you know, a cup of you know, or two of Greek yogurt. You know, the ratio is to meet your consistency. We'll throw some chia seeds in there, maybe some frozen blueberries. And we'll just like pulse it in a blender until it turns over and it turns into an ice cream consistency. Mm. Scoop it with an ice cream scooper, put it into like a little clear glass dish and like serve it to the kids or you know that us also great. it's so freaking good or just blend it a little further and turn it into a smoothie like i'll sit on the couch after dinner like i'll eat that as my quote dessert right which man like if you go to a restaurant and they serve that as like a 15 dollar dessert you're gonna be like this was the best dessert it was so worth that money yeah. right it, so it's like taking that and adding it into it just takes a little bit more time and effort like my right, wife makes right. these that we call but that is what also makes it delicious too is the time and effort yeah and it's a commu communal you know the whole family's in on it and so like making sure like our kids like my kids now every night they want their smoothie they don't want ice cream they don't want they don't want treats it's like every it's like hey seven o'clock is smoothie time because you know like 8 8 30 is like bedtime for the kids have you ever seen the uh, ninja creamy no so the ninja, so ninja, they make the blenders and the different yeah, things, okay. right? So they also make something called the ninja creamy, which basically turns a lot of the stuff that you're talking, it turns it into ice cream. Okay. You, you basically just take like you'll you'll still use a shaker or or um, a blender, and then you pour it into this like cylinder thing. You throw it in the freezer, so it still needs to freeze. So a little planning needs to go on, but then when you put it in the ninja creamy, the way that it whips it and blends it it turns the stuff into ice cream. So it could turn like protein shakes basically into, into ice cream. Sounds awesome. It's, un it's I'll unbelievable. I'll check that out. You'll, you'll have like a, a 90 gram protein freaking bowl of ice cream. <laughs> Who doesn't, what meathead doesn't want that, right? <laughs> it's absolutely delicious. So there's, I mean, there are a lot of options like that out there. It's just, yeah, you do need to be a little crafty. You do need to think outside the box. But I do simple stuff too. I'll just take uh, vanilla protein powder, I'll throw it in some Greek yogurt, give it a couple stirs. I know the protein powder is processed or whatever, but like for me, it's like that simple, easy, quick, yep. 40, 50 grams of protein, great snack. Yep. And it hits all those, uh, those pleasure sensors that I was trying to get before when I was fatter with uh, eating peanut butter cups and stuff like that. Absolutely. And it's like protein, depending on the quality, right? It's as processed as a Greek yogurt. So it's like, depending on, on the quality again, quality matters. If you look at it like that, it's like, well, man, have Greek yogurt, you could have a, a whey protein and hit all of your quality needs and your macro needs per se, and your culturally significant taste bud needs, right? And just for people to just put a little bit of time and effort into it, and they have to have the will and the desire to make that change. Cause it's very easy to just defer your health to Chipotle or your spouse who doesn't care. Cause you know, like most people, spouses, they're just trying to make a hot meal that people are gonna eat, right? right? You know, the wife- Something quick and easy sometimes, yeah. Yeah, she just wants, she's like, she's enough of everybody, enough of you fools. Like, right. I just wanna eat this, shut up, eat this. Like, I wanna sit in front of the TV and drink a glass of wine, right? That's happening in most households and I understand that. But with a little bit of I don't want to say care, but a little bit of planning, you can really turn this upside down from the traditional model. Know that you're feeding everyone healthy food, getting your own health back in place, right? Changing just like the whole mind frame. Cause you know, like when you're eating crappy food, you're like cloudy. Oh yeah. You're never clean and crisp, right? And the deeper that you get into it, the better that you feel and the more that you want to keep sinking into it That's when it. you're eating good foods. Yeah. So it's like, it's hard now for us to not do this. It's harder for us to go to the other way than it is to just keep moving Feels forward. Feels way here. too good. Right? Yeah. All right, man, where can people find you? TheDolceDiet.com or the Dolce Diet on Instagram. Strength is never weak this week, this is never strength. Catch you guys later.